Hey everybody, welcome to the Greg's Garage Pod with co-host Jason Pridmore. This week we are presented by Competition Works. Thanks to the folks at Competition Works. Uh, Jason, I don't know if you know this or not, but a couple of years ago, the general manager of Competition Works, Sean Ryan, you took his daughter for a two-up ride at Chuck Wallet. I'm sure you remember that, right? <laughs> no, but I, it, I've given so many, Greg. I've given so many two-up rides, so... I'm sh- I'm trying to think about when it was. I wonder if it was like the Femme Walla event or something. Sean could probably tell us, anyways. Yeah, I don't know, dude. Have you ever seen the competition work stuff? I mean, it is just yeah. I have it's it. Great. I have it. It is. I mean, it looks GP, yep. and I actually have sounds a pipe. it. It does sound yeah, <laughs> yeah definitely sounds great. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I have a Triumph Street Triple, you know, and it's a good company. They're like you know, kind of small Oregon based company, and they do like fender elimination kits, and they have like foot pegs and stuff like that. So it's pretty neat stuff, and, and we're glad to have them on board. If you're interested in what they have to offer, you go to Competition Works. Works is actually spelled W-E-R-K-E-S. So competition, W-E-R-K-E-S dot com. And you can check out Competition Works, the exhausts, and all the other stuff they have to offer. So Jason, here we are getting this podcast going. You are on your way to Phillip Island really soon. How was your last week? I am. Yeah. You know, Greg, I actually leave today. It's, you know, I leave today. To, I got to drive out to Chuckwalla. Uh, I got to be there tomorrow, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, CVMA weekend uh, this weekend. And I'll be riding um, with friends and stuff on the lead up up to it. So, and then we leave straight from Chuckwalla on Sunday. We leave straight to the airport. So we're all going to, there's probably about, oh man, I don't know, maybe eight or 10 of us getting on a plane together uh that that evening so we're gonna shower up out there at chuck Walla and then rip out to lax and get on a plane so i'm excited about it i'm looking forward to getting over to phillip island uh obviously it's there's been a a big build up to it because i just i loved it so much last year so i've got some uh, really close friends going over there with us this year again and we're gonna do a two-day track day after the event so we're gonna ride on the weekend race on the weekend and I'm excited. I talked to Josh Hayes this morning. We caught up a little bit. And I know Steve Rapp and Larry Pegram, Michael Gilbert, all these guys are excited about getting over there. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be good. Uh, Jay, did you see on Bike Sport News that some dude named David Johnson, this is the quote, David Johnson is waiting to kick some American arse at the <laughs> Phillip Island Classic. Did you get to read that yet? It just came out. I did. Yeah, I did. I did. I sent it to all my boys so they could they could. They could read. Look, this event is, it's only going to get more and more serious. Uh, it seems like now <laughs> over the last two years, three years, the event has, is starting to draw some even bigger names and more current riders and racers. And um, look, Davos, he's such a good dude. He's such a great guy. And if you actually is read he? the article, I, yeah. well, no, read I, the article I, he never yeah. actually even says that. So, but you know, nothing like a little, you know, shit talk to get the pot stirring, I guess. But you know, I, I look at it. I'm going over there for a good time. I had such a blast last year. I think, I think that this year we're going over there with a a, a real team. I'm bummed Jake Zemke's not going with us, but mm. we've got we've got a great team. And David Crussell's done a good job preparing extra motorcycles so that we can take a little bit more of a team and support the event. Bummed that the Brits aren't going to be there, although I know a few of them are lining up some rides. And uh, less sounds like the New Zealand team is going to be a little better this year. So. Um, it's a it's a fun event. It's a great event, and I can hardly wait to get on a plane because it's pouring rain right now in California. So, oh wow, get on a, get on a plane and get over to the summer of Australia. All I'm going to say is he said this quote: "The American team, well, Jason Pridmore will be hard to tame. He was the fastest U.S. rider last year in that team. The U.S. team is very similar to last year from what I've seen, uh, except the bike should be a lot better than last year, as you know." Oh, as they know what they have been to do. I don't even know. I'm not even going to read anymore, but all I can just, I keep my eyes on the American team while Jason Pridmore will be hard to tame. I love that. That's fantastic. Well, that's nice of him. Uh, you know, last year, Greg, I went faster than I reckoned I would. I, I, you know, look, I'm, I know where I'm at with, with my, with my, uh, with my racing and my riding. I haven't raced in since 2014. I'm, you know, for me, uh, Josh Hayes and, and Steve Rapp and all these guys were, rivals of mine at one time they're my friends now we we have a laugh and i know that you know once once you get started everybody wants to win but it's a team event like my goal this year is to really go over there and try to win as a team and if we can do that then that 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 would be great and uh 
No, can't for wait me, to that's, hear the that's what it's man. all about. It should yeah. be great. I can't wait to hear it. All right. So we'll move on from that and just want to give everyone. Well, hold a, on. Hold what? on. Let me just say what? this too. All right. What? I, I got to do it. We're not a, we're not a football podcast. I get it. But <laughs> I got to give props to you, G-Dub, and your New England Patriots for making it through. Me and Paul Carruthers are crying uh, in misery as our team's both lost. Uh, Raj is already at home crying because his Bears lost. I would have loved uh, to have seen somebody get through. Your boy, Tom Brady, he's the GOAT. Best of all time. Your coach, he's the GOAT too. We are not a football podcast. I get it. I probably take heat for me coming out and saying stuff like that. But props to you and your team. 13 divisional champ- championship games in a row. Everybody was writing your guys off, and they just dominated the Chargers. So will I be pulling for them in the, in the play, you know, for the remainder here? Yes, of I, course you will. Of course you will. Because you're a just friend. For you. Just, just, just for, for you. You're, you're, you're a friend. Just, We're just tight, for you. You know what I mean? It just it it's whatever we're marching into, just, we're marching into Arrowhead, dude. It's going to be a tall task. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. That, you know, that, I you you have been actually you've probably been hating on your Pats more, more than I've ever heard this year. What? Just a little bit. You have been. You you. I think that you were in the same kind of thought process that they weren't going to get there. But anybody that's <clears> watching <throat> football, just know that yeah. New England is Greg's team. Always has been. He claims forever, even though he was singing the Eagles fight song at the beginning of this year. I was never at, ever. At, Ever. At the stadium with me. There's um, video in your phone to prove I wasn't standing for up, sure. cheering I was for the rolling Eagles, my eyes. Whatever. No. Anyways, no. moving forward. No. Good luck this weekend moving in your for- game. Yeah. Yeah. Thank good you. Good luck. Thank you. Yes. I'll text you. Keep your Wi Fi on. <laughs> no, you know what? Turn your Wi Fi off. So when you're in Australia, uh, you know, like Monday, I'll text you. So just charge up data. Just just kill you with the data. Correct. All right, look, yeah. A lot of people have been asking us questions about Jake Gagne. Yes. Got a hold of Jake Gagne. He had a motocross accident. He broke both the tib fib. He had surgery on it last week. It was successful. This is what Jake wanted me to tell everybody. He's going to be fine. He's going to recover. And he will be in the Moto America paddock in 2019, more than likely on a super bike. That's my, that's, you know, he said that information is coming probably in the next week or so. So for those Jake Gagne fans, I'm happy he's back in Moto America, Jason, and I'm glad that his leg injury is going to be okay and he'll be back to racing a motorcycle road race bike sometime soon. I love Jake Gagne. I think he is, you know, he's he's so talented. Uh, you know, obviously we know he went and did a motocross national a few years ago, sure qualified did. for it, finished both motos, the whole bit. The guy is extremely talented on a, on a motorcycle, no matter what you put him on. I think that going over to World Superbike when he did, it was a tough time for him to do it, but he did it. And he went and had a go and he had a shot. And I'm I'm proud of him for that. Bummed that he got hurt. I'm really excited that he's going to be back in our paddock by the sounds of it. And uh, I'm looking forward to hearing what it might be on. I've got my guesses and uh, I'll leave it at that for now. But <laughs> I think I think that he's a guy that could be very much a sleeper depending on development and things that they can do. It goes right back to what we say in all of our podcasts, Greg. Got to have a good team, good bike, good rider, good crew chief. If he can somehow mold those together and get some test time in, not sure how this injury is going to prevent that from happening for him. But uh, for sure, if there's a way that uh, Jake Gagne can get on a bike, he, he will be up front. And that's what we that's all we can hope for. So just get better, Jake, and uh, and be ready for the season. So, Jason, keeping with the Moto America theme, a press release came out at the beginning of the week that says, well, I'm going to read you the the top of the line because this is great. Alex Dumas joins Road Racing World Young Gun Scholarship Program with Team Hammer. 16-year-old French-Canadian joins the effort under the new Road Racing World Young Gun Scholarship Program, which will see him compete in the 2019 Moto America Twins Cup Championship aboard a Team Hammer Technical Services-supported Suzuki SV650. Over the past two seasons, as we know, Dumas established himself in the field. Now I'm just kind of paraphrasing, you know. Obviously, he won races in 2017. Last year, he won 10 of 17 races to win the championship by 74 points. He went and did a world super sport round. Jason, I'm, I'm, I have a feeling you have some inside information because it's a two year contract for Dumas. who will be competing in the Moto America AMA FIM North American road race championship. So what do you think? I mean, number one, what do you think about Alex and this opportunity? Number two, we've talked about it before. How good is the paddock using the twins cup class now? to use it as like a a development area. What do you think? 
Well, leave it to, you know, Chris and John at Road Racing World to basically when this whole thing started to come together, uh, getting Alex on a 600 and, and advancing uh, was was the key that that I think a lot of people would like to see our kids go from Junior Cup uh, and, and advance. And um, money definitely was an issue as far as, um, you know, being able to put him on a 600. The, you know, John and Chris were interested in Alex and they put him on a GSXR 600, but they came up with an idea that was actually a really good idea, I thought. They're, they're going to put him in the Twins Cup so it is going to be an advancement of a bike off of what he rode last year, but they're also going to be letting him test a 600 throughout the year um, so that he doesn't have to just jump right into a, a 600 class. He's a very young 16 years old, so he's got a little bit of time. And I think that the Twins Club class will be a, a great platform for him this year to continue his advancement, uh, communicate with team. Uh, a little bit more. Now he's going to be on a proper team where in the past it's just been, you know, him and his dad um, and Hugo doing their stuff along with KTM. Now he's going to be with a new group of people. They've tested twice already. They went to Barber and put him on a 600 and then they, they came out here to California and he rode kind of a, a, a sort of a 60% version of what he's going to be racing. I guess you could call it at Chuck Walla. He just came out and tested a little bit and everything went great. And I think, this is kind of neat for Moto America too, because we're kind of seeing this year, and I'm kind of hearing already, Greg, more people in the Twins Club and more people in the Thousand Superstock class, like more legitimate type of people in both of those classes. Uh, and this might be an area where, by John and Chris creating the Road Racing World Scholarship kind of fund for this 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 program, it might give other kids an opportunity after Alex, give them a place to go or an idea of what could be next, especially if they're very young. I think if, you, if Alex was 21, 22, 23, or even 18, 19 at that stage, the 600 might have been a bit more viable. He's still growing. He's still young. This will be a way for him to still be competitive and on the side get to test a, a, a GSX-R 600 for the team and move forward so that in 2020, he'll be even more prepared for the 600 class. I think it's a great move. Yeah, I think it's a great move too. And uh, you're right. I mean, from 2017 to 18, I think the kid grew like three or four inches. I mean, so yeah. obviously from that perspective, he's still growing. And, you know, looking across the the rules and the class platform, I think it's a really good way for, it, it, you know, it's kind of like in a way like Apple, right? When Apple made the iPhone, Jason, they said, look, we don't know how people are going to use apps, but this is what an app does. And and then you had people creating apps. I mean, the app store is full of stuff. I think in, in a similar vein, you have Moto America that says, here's the rules, here are the classes. And I think that Twins Cup ended up being the class we thought it was going to be in 2018. Correct. In terms of, I agree with you. Right. Yeah. right? And, but now the paddock is getting creative and they're saying, how can we use Stock 1000? How can we use Twins Cup to our advantage? Maybe get bikes out on the grid, more of bikes that we're sponsored with. Of course, you know, Team Hammer has Suzuki sponsorship, so it's perfect for the SV650. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy for Alex. And, you know, if you're the, if you're the twins cup competitors from 2018 and you're looking at Alex and the speed he has, you've got to figure out how to step your game up. If you're planning on coming back to race in 19, no doubt. I think that, I think that what it does is it, is it's going to bring, it might get some more guys up and more interested in that class. I mean, now the competition, I think in all our classes is going to be stepped up next year. Um, you know, even like even talking earlier about Gagne coming back, I think all, if you look at all of our classes right now in Moto America, um, kind of the breeding ground classes are Super Stock Thousand and the Twins Cup. And last year was their first year. I don't think that they got really a lot of notoriety. I did talk to uh, I talked to Andrew Lee yesterday. It looks like he's going to be back in Thousand Super Stock. The list of guys that we'll talk about, you know, in future podcasts coming up. That, that the thousand superstock class is going to be pretty loaded this year. It's going to be a really fun class to watch. And you're right, Greg, this gives manufacturers another opportunity to showcase a bike or bikes that maybe they otherwise wouldn't. And the twins club is going to do that. And I think that, uh, I think that this road racing world scholarship is going to be a, a, a neat place for Alex to continue to grow, continue to learn, build relationships with people other than the ones he's most comfortable with, meaning his family and, and, uh, and so on. He's, he's going to be getting a whole new group of people under a tent that he's going to have to, ex you know, explain things to and work on. 
Uh, it's a great advancement for him. And on the side of it, he's going to get to ride a 600. I, I've ridden 600s with Alex. He he could have he could have gone to the 600 class this year, but I think that this is a smarter step with less pressure. Try to go out, maybe win another championship while testing a 600 on the side and being even more prepared for 2020. And who knows what Suzuki's got up their sleeve moving forward, Greg. I mean, GSX-R 600 definitely could use an update. And, uh, as you know, it, we're hearing that some manufacturers are coming out with new bikes in 2020. So we'll just see, see what that, that leads on to. So moving forward, Greg, the world Superbike entry list came out this week and just looking over the, the list itself, were there any big surprises to you being, uh, you know, just looking at the list of riders that we have? Not, not in terms of riders themselves. I think the level of equipment kind of surprised me a little bit. What about you? No, I think you're 100% right. I think when you look down the list, you got Ray Haslam, Davis, Batista, Lowe's, Vandemark, obviously Cowie, Ducati, Yamaha, all factory. You got BMW with Ryderberger and Sykes factory. You got Michael Rubin, Ronaldo. He was essentially, he's riding for the Barney team. We know that's a factory bike. Top Rack, staying uh, with Pachetti racing again. Uh, That bike that Top Rack is on is actually factory Kawasaki, no question. Camir and Mm -hmm. Kianari, factory Hondas, right? Um, we got mm-hmm. Cortese and Melandri on the new GRT Yamaha World Superbike team. Those are factory bikes. And I know that 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 you see you got Jordi Torres, uh, Mercado. Those guys are both going to be on Kawasaki. He's glad to see Torres get a ride. Not sure how good that's going to be. You got Alessandro uh, Del Bianco on. He's on a he's on a Honda CBR 1000 uh, sponsored by Altea. So it'll, that'll be interesting. But when you look at it, Greg, all factory bikes, including one other guy that I that, that I know we're we're going to get a chance maybe to chat with here in a minute, but Eugene Laverty, riding for the Team Go Eleven. Um, you probably know a little bit more about that, and we'll find out through our podcast. But man, there's a lot of factory supported guys. A lot. I mean, yeah. Like, you're just looking down this list, I mean, you got two Cowies, two Ducatis, four Yamahas, two BMWs. You're saying the top rack is is a factory bike. I mean, you're you're talking out of 18 entries, you have factory or factory supported bikes. I think all, but maybe two or three motorcycles. That's, that's pretty incredible. All right. So world Superbike had a thing that they call like by the number. So it's 18 competitors. They're saying a whole 10 factory backed teams, you know, with bikes. I think they're saying four more than last season. I think if you really look at that list, there's more than that. There's nine different countries represented you have Japan being represented for the first time since 2012. The youngest rider is going to be 21, I believe is what they're saying. And that's Alessandro uh, Del Bianco, who comes in from the Stock 1000 class. So there's a lot of positives, I think, pointing in the direction of how many champions are in the class, whether it's Superbike or other classes. So for me, I think you know the series looks really promising in terms of the best it's been competitive-wise. Does that make sense? No, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think that when you look at it, it almost feels like the manufacturers are trying to support teams better, like put guys on better motorcycles and create a, a more of an even playing field, I guess it could be. I mean, it just seems like with all the factory supported rides, uh, you know, World Superbike's trying desperately to get back to where it was years and years ago in its heyday. And I think that the only way they're going to do that is just by increasing the amount of competitive bikes that are on the grid. Because back in the day, there were... 10 or 12 guys literally that could win right now. You really history over the last two or three years shows that three or four guys are capable of winning races. So when you have that many factory supported bikes, it makes me a little nervous for like uh, Mercado, Leonardo Mercado and, and even Torres, because I think they're both quality, quality riders. I just don't know how good their cowies are going to be. But, but when you look at what they call factory bikes and what they call factory supported bikes, you know, last year when you're looking at Chavi Fora's run up front and get like the first independent, you know, first independent rider across the line award type yeah, of deal. Yeah. He, he's on a factory Ducati. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he really was. Uh, you know, Michael Ruben Rinaldi takes over that ride and he's been in and around the Ducati family for years and years now. Super stock thousand champion from a couple years ago. Um, and he takes over for Fora's. But there are, there are factory bikes, uh, maybe in different wrappings, but there are definitely factory bikes on that grid that aren't getting classified as factory bikes. And one of the guys that we didn't really talk about a lot is going to be, um, you know, when you, when you look at that World Superbike entry list, there were a few of the riders' names that didn't 
they well, they almost didn't make it to the grid. Yeah. And some of those riders um, were linked to ride or two in the United States in Moto America. Now, one of them is 10-time World Superbike race winner Eugene Laverty. He's former Aprilia factory racer, and he gave me the briefs on his plan for 2019. Well, in the end, I uh, managed to find myself a uh, Ducati to continue in World Superbikes with the uh, Go11 team. It was pretty nerve-wracking, to be honest, towards the end of the, the year, trying to find a seat like uh, a lot of riders, but uh, managed to get signed up. And, well, it was so nice to see the factory guys going out and testing in Europe and hauling ass right away. So that was uh, enough I needed to, to sign the contract, and uh, the V4 really looks the part. Yeah, and... Jay, you, we were just talking about, you know, the level of equipment and who's going to be on what bike. So that was obviously my next question to him. So this is how he had to answer that. Well, the bike I'm starting with is the bike that Chaz Davies was riding at the test. It was basically a lot of uh, their garage straight into my team's workshop. So it's nice to know that I'm starting off with a good base. Sure, there's going to be upgrades, things like swing arms, the usual with a new bike. Um my goal is to be up there fighting with the factory guys so that when new updates do come, then uh, I'm going to be in line with them as well. Because if I'm getting the results, then uh, hopefully <laughs> Ducati will see that uh, the potential is there. Will there be information sharing between your team and the factory team? Do you know? Yeah, sure. And that's one thing Gigi Delinia has always done when I work with him in the past as well at Aprilia. Everything was open and shared. And it's the same in Ducati when I was there in MotoGP. In 2016, my bike was two years older than the, the factory ones, but I was able to see uh, their data every evening, and, and that was a big help. It meant that for Ducati too, it helped because you had so much more information to study tire and data, all the rest, um, to prepare for the race. So I think they see it as a benefit for them as well as being a benefit for us in the private team. So another bike that's got to have factory support, right? Did you hear the name in there though? Yeah, I did. Gigi Delina, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and again, this is a guy that, you know, it was with Aprilia for years, came to Ducati, saw immediate success. I feel with the Ducati. So obviously Eugene has a, has a relationship with Gigi, which is great. And Eugene Laverty deserves and needs to be on the world Superbike grid. Uh, we lost some guys this year that I think are very formidable riders, but if, if they'd have lost Eugene, I think that would have been a big loss because this guy, he rides hard all the time. I think the the hardest thing as a fan for me is it always seems that Eugene kind of comes in with these, you know, he's always got a new team. He's always got something he's got to develop. He's, he never just kind of walks into the, the really great stuff, you know, mm, um, no 10 doubt. time Superbike winner. But I think that his relationship with Gigi probably had something to do with this coming together last minute for him. So he sounds excited about it. And I agree. I think it's a big confidence boost knowing that Chaz has already ridden your bike and pretty much got, the shakedown out of the way, right, Greg? I mean, I he's got thinking. a lot of the shakedown part. Yeah, I think it's a great, yeah. I think it's got to give him a lot of confidence. Yeah, I know. I totally agree with that. And, you know, the other thing too is that he's jumping on a Ducati in V4, which is similar to what the GP bike was. So, you know, I, I was thinking to myself during this interview with Eugene, I was like, I asked him, you know, it seems like the V4 is very friendly to him. And this is what he said. It does seem to have always suited my style with uh, the Aprilia in particular. I get on well with the bike. Um, some riders seem to ride better with a, an inline, but yeah, the V4, especially back in the day when I was winning races on the Aprilia, the, the torque that bike had was is incredible. And this Ducati, the the horsepower I know it's putting out is is really something else. Now, Jason, I know that you've ridden inline fours, obviously, but a lot of yeah. people might not remember the fact that you were on Ducatis um, for a spell. Um, as a, a factory, I barely equipment. remember it, Greg. I barely remember. Oh, I it. don't. Was I that don't. long ago? You nearly, <laughs> yeah, but you nearly yeah. podiumed, or didn't somebody blow it like oil? Didn't Gobert blew oil in front of you? Or I can't remember. But yeah, but so would have, should have, could have. Don't matter. But distinctly, <laughs> distinctly different motorcycles. Have you had a chance to ride a V four that you can think of on the I, track? I have not, and I've got a couple friends with the new Ducati, so um, that have offered it to me, but I, I just haven't had a chance to. Um, I, I think that, you know, when I look at this move by Ducati, it, I mean, not only, I mean, Ducati is always at the forefront. They come, come out with great stuff, but this is, this bike is really being, this is like the Johnny Ray killer, isn't it? This, that's, that's, that's what's going to motivate Johnny Ray this year, mm -hmm. knowing that basically a manufacturer's built a bike to come after him. They've hired 
Alvaro Batista. They've got four basically factory bikes on the grid chasing him. So I think for Ducati, this is them putting as much into World Superbike as we've seen them put in in the past. Obviously, we know Chaz is a race winner. Batista is going to be extremely strong. So I feel like I think this is Ducati's way of coming after it. I think Eugene senses that, even talking about the numbers that the bike is putting out horsepower wise. And, you know, I think Gigi Delini is going to be a, he's going to be involved maybe more just hearing his name in there. Um, so, you know, the Ducati I rode Greg was so long ago and it, but I just remember how easy they were to ride. And now Ducati's development has gone so completely the other direction. Um, it seems, uh, it also seems like the last few years, their bike hasn't been the easiest to ride. If you, read some of the comments and you watch some of the clips and you see the bike. I think that this is going to be a good step for them. Uh, a new step that they're going to be able to take some of their MotoGP technology and really plug it into their world superbike. Yeah. Because Ducati was really good at some places and not good at other places. Now, correct for, for Eugene, he has not had a chance to throw a leg over that bike yet, but as you know, Jason, he's pretty friendly with Chaz Davis. He <laughs> yeah. has ridden it. Yep. So my, my lead in to the question was, you seem to know Chad pretty well. Yeah, we're pretty much family, to be honest. Um, my brother Michael is married to, to Chaz's sister, Jody, and we've known each other for a long time. We first met in like 1999 when we were just kids. So yeah, 20 years ago, and we've known each other since. It's pretty funny when you think about it. We were just running around, um, not a care in the world, riding BMXs around racing paddocks while my older brother were racing. And then suddenly we both find ourselves uh, student awards at bike podium together and it was one of those moments where you think, geez, how the hell did that happen? <laughs> so have you had a so cool. chance to talk with him about his impressions of the new motorcycle? A little bit. I spoke with him as well as even uh, Michael Rinaldi. When I was at Rossi's Ranch, Rinaldi was there. He'd done the Aragon test along with Chaz. And the positive thing is they said um, there isn't really any weakness in the bike compared to the V-Twin. It does everything uh, at least as good. You know, it's not like they've said... Uh, long corners the bike doesn't turn as well or braking it's not as good they say yeah this is only positive so to hear that and knowing um how fast the thing is going to be in a straight line uh, i'm very optimistic just hearing what he's saying there that the the twin had a few weaknesses didn't it i mean <laughs> you could kind of see it and hear about it so the fact that he's talking to the guys that have already ridden the bike they're coming back with a lot of positives i think that i think that the riders that they've got on that bike they're all going to hopefully unite a little bit to try to make the thing better and if they can all come back with good solid um not only reviews but information so that the techs can get that bike where they needed to get it and you'll really start to see it greg when all those guys are on the track at the same time the the data if there's some data sharing uh i don't think it's going to be don't think it's going to be long before that ducati's winning races i mean they i think they test at aragon and i think they go to jerez and then they go straight to phillip island and they do the test the week before so he's going to get some time on it he will get some time on it and since you kind of answered that question, I'm going to play this anyway, because that was my next question. When will you get to test the bike? I'm counting down the days. It's exactly 10 days until I get out there. So itching to get going in uh, Jerez for two days. And then we have two days off. We go across to Portugal and then in two days in Porto Mayo as well. So it's key to get dry weather. Although um, I know I am going to be limited on how many laps I'm able to do, unfortunately, just with engine mileage and things like that. So... Um, every lap's going to have to count whenever uh, I go out there. I have to put my head down. Uh, there'll be no slow laps because whenever you're limited on mileage, you've uh, you've got to just make the most of it. You can't be cruising around uh, wasting those uh, those kilometers. There's not a ton of parts available yet for the V4. So that's the indicator is that he's only going to have a handful of laps. Not a handful, but he's not going to be able to go out and do 90 laps or 100 laps a day. He's going to be very limited, Jay especially for the initial tests. I think by the time they get over to Phillip Island that, you know, he'll be able to get a bunch of tests in it. But when you're, when you're as experienced as Eugene is and, is, and you've ridden as many bikes as he's ridden, uh, this is where having known that Chaz has already ridden this bike and kind of shook it down a little bit is going to help him confidence wise, because he knows the tracks. He'll go to Jerez for a couple of days. They'll pick up, move over to Portimao and, you know, both tracks that he knows very well. Hopefully the weather's great for him so he can get those laps, but literally, by his third, fourth, fifth lap, he's already gonna gonna, gonna get a feel, an initial feel. Uh and and then it's just a matter of just trying to get used to it. The the first day that he's on that thing at Hareth, uh, the amount of laps that he's gonna get, um sounding by by it's gonna be a little bit limited. 
you know, he's going to a place he knows. He's going to get up to speed quick. He knows mm-hmm. what it takes to go fast around there, Greg. So uh, that that part doesn't really bother me so much. And, you know, we always talk about it's much more important to get quality laps than the, than the quantity itself. If he can go out and get himself some quality laps, come back with good information, they'll be able to make changes overnight. And then they go to Portimao. Get him some more time there. I think it's in a, I think it's great that he's getting to go ride some of these tracks that he actually has to race at too, which is good. And the next question, Jay, is kind of weird because the guy's never even been on the bike, hasn't you know, with, especially with his competitors. But I was just interested in where his mind was when I asked him where he thought he would end up in 2019 when the season was over. At least top five in the championship, I would say that's what uh, I got to aim at because there is those six bikes and I've got to beat a few of them come season end. Um, definitely got to win a race again, um, at least one, and regularly be on the podium because even last year towards the the end of the season, I was uh, always consistently there, not quite getting those podiums, but always knocking on the door regularly, fourth and fifth, fifth places. So um, it's just been a, a tough few years and things like coming back on the, the Aprilia and uh, expecting to find my old bike and it wasn't the case. You know, the rules had changed, so... That's why this time around, um, I really just searched out uh, the best bike available. And with a new V4 Ducati, really, um, Ducati have been pulling out all the stops. They they want to beat Kawasaki, and uh, I want to be part of that. <laughs> well, look, I think that as a as a person talking to a racer, that's a very honest answer because racers always want to win every race, and. And Eugene knows how hard that is. I think his expectations are very, very realistic. I think that he'll exceed those um, myself. When you look at what he's got to race against, the Cowie will be a little bit better. He's got to beat his teammates. By teammates, I mean other Ducati riders. The Yamaha hasn't really done anything, and we don't know about the BMW. I know that on the Aprilia, like you said, he was coming good towards the end. I really feel like he had a shot at podium, if not better, in the first race at Portimao. He put it on the pole. Uh that morning, Saturday morning, he was on pole position and then got completely taken out by Forez in turn four, three or four, whatever they call it there at Portimao, tight right-hander. I was, I was actually standing in the corner, Greg, when that happened. I felt so Ooh. bad for him. But uh, the thing is, is that, is that I think that's a realistic expectation for him. To finish top five in World Superbike, you've got to make sure that you finish races. I mean, now that, now that they're doing a three-race format on a weekend, uh, you know, it, it becomes even more important to just keep on racking up those points. And I think that that Eugene could do that. So, and I wouldn't put it past him to win a race or two or three this year, just depending with that many chances. You got to remember he's getting, what's he, what's he getting Greg? Is it how many rounds is the series? Greg, it's 16. Mm, I believe. Yeah. 16. Seven, yeah. 16. So he's getting 16 more starts with the third race that they've added. So I don't put it past him to, to, to win a race or two this year. I think it's just going to be a matter of how quickly he gets up to speed and, and what he does on the bike, you know, as far yeah. as testing. And what parts he gets, you know, the, that type of thing. And I think earlier when he was talking about he needs to be up there racing with the factory guys, the force, the hand of the factory to continue to up, update his motorcycle. I think that's kind of a good strategy. I did, yep. you know, I did ask him, that's not on here, Jay, but I did ask him a little bit about confidence. I think it was maybe after we were done. And and he said that, you know, getting the podium at Laguna and then a second podium the race after that really helped to boost his confidence in terms of like heading into 2019. So he knows he can be competitive. Obviously that little bit of the last sound bite that we heard. And as we know with motorcycle racers, that mental aspect is tremendous, but he did tell me that there were times when he was in MotoGP and the results he was getting there, that his confidence took a beating, but world Superbike helped to kind of stack him back up, you know, which is really good because He's still relatively young. He's 34, I think. Yeah. 30, 32, yep. 34. And um, he's got a lot of racing left in him, in my opinion. You know. No, there's no question. And I think that you could go longer now. We've said this before as well. You can go longer because the bikes have become easier to ride and they're a little mm-hmm. safer and they're a little bit... If, if your mind is in it and you're, in, and you're staying in somewhat shape uh, physically, I think, uh, um, I think that for sure you can last longer. I mean, let's not forget, Greg, we've had... What if we have one or two world superbike champions that have been 40 years old i think cheka and i believe bayless both 40 yeah. mm-hmm. uh, or literally right in and around there um mm-hmm. they were world superbike champions and that was boy we're going back five five six years ago or more now that 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 happened what seven maybe eight years ago now so so now you're looking at guys that that you know the johnny rays and some of these other guys are just i mean they, you know they're mid thirties or, or I think Johnny's only like 32. So it might've been a bad example, but there's a couple guys there that are mid thirties and older that are moving forward, but 
they're still plenty fast and on their day they, they still win races so yeah biaggi um, was late in his career still winning races correct that's a, that that was the other one correct i think it was mm-hmm. biaggi when he won mm-hmm. as well so mm-hmm. so um i don't think age is really to be fair is anywhere near as important as it used to be and when you come off of what he did in moto gp that being eugene and see some of the stuff that you know, I, I obviously we know he wasn't on the best equipment. And there was a lot of struggles there. You come back to a championship and you're competitive. It gives you, it revives you a little bit. It makes you feel like, yeah, you know, I mm. I I can ride with these guys. Um, so yeah, good good for him on that. And I think that he'll be he'll be up front. Well, with all that talk in 2019, yeah, you know, with all that stuff covered, I did ask him if he would like to dispel any rumors about his parting ways with his old team, and here was his answer. Well, it, it was two great years with SMR on the April year. It was tough to begin with because um, the the bike wasn't up to scratch, but we, we worked hard and I'm proud of what we achieved, uh, especially in the second half of the year, getting those podiums, getting a pole position at Portimao. And it was looking like I was all set to to switch to BMW with the team. They were moving manufacturer and uh, for three months, everything uh, was in place. And then yeah, suddenly it wasn't, but that's how it goes in racing. Um, they they opted for Tom Sykes uh, at the last moment, and that that left me in the in the lurch a little bit. But um, thankfully, I managed to find a seat, and all's well that, that ends well. Uh, I'll be on the track competing against those guys um, in 2019, and yeah, there's there's no hard feelings. It's just um, another bike out there that I've got to try and beat if I want to be in that top step. Come on, that well, was re- that was real PC. I mean, I know that's got to motivate him a little bit. Come on, you know. It's funny because you and I don't go through this stuff, like the question stuff, especially when you're doing the interviews with riders. I, I love kind of hearing it for the first time when we're doing our podcast. And when you wrote what you wrote in, in our in our, in our our notes here, I, I'd completely forgotten, Greg, honestly. I'd completely forgotten that, that, that the BMW team is Eugene's old team. And Me I remember when I, when I was reading it, I was thinking to myself, gosh, they, they're, Eugene's kind of getting left out there. I, Greg, do you not somehow feel a little bit like he almost got the better deal, though? I mean, I almost feel like it seems like the Ducati thing is like directed right at the factory and he's got more riders to base it off of. There's going to be more rice racers worldwide that, you know, even when you look at BSB, you've got Redding and, and Josh Brooks on the new Ducati. Uh, it just seems to me like there might be a little bit more information. He might even be able to get up to speed a little bit quicker on this bike. Um, oh, that, listen, then, I don't yeah, know. I just, it's just a gut feeling I have. No, well, if you think about it from a racing perspective, Eyes are always forward. If you're looking behind you, you're going slower, right? Yep. So yep. Kawasaki's the benchmark, and Ducati yep. is now putting together this super team of information anyway that's looking to topple Kawasaki. Who's BMW looking to topple? They're looking Correct. to topple Ducati and Everybody. Kawasaki, right? Yeah. And Yamaha. I mean, and, Yam- and, and, and Yamaha. Yamaha. 100% so, and Yamaha. Yep. So, yeah, from that perspective, if I if I put my mind in that space, I would say you're absolutely right. At the moment, even though it's a privateer team and we don't know you know, where uh, Eugene's going to fall in terms of the upgraded parts and those types of things, I would say that you're probably right. It's, he's landed in a, I don't know if it's better, but I can tell you it's a very good deal. The Go because 11 you, thing. You, yeah. you got to think, let's, let's, let's just work something out here. Let's say for argument's sake, that Tom Sykes decided to sign on the same deal that Eugene's on now. Mm-hmm. Tom's been on arguably the best bike. And and obviously there were some team things being broke down there throughout the last year to make things go sour there at Kawasaki for Tom. We know that he's quality. I, I obviously the guy's quality. Um, but when you really have a sit down and you think about it, if you'd have thought to yourself, Tom Sykes is going into to Ducati, you'd honest, obviously thought to yourself, well, that's kind of a level playing from what he just got off of as far as the Cowie to the Ducati, especially this new bike. So, BMW right now, because we don't know anything that they've tested, we don't know how good the bikes are, we don't know any of that stuff. Uh, you, right now, you got to rate them as third, fourth best bike on the grid. Um, yeah. Obviously, I think the, the only the only bike behind them probably is the Honda. Uh, obviously, so I think that Eugene, look, he's he's on a team that's just him. He's by himself, so that's you know that's good because the team's going to put all their resources into him, but. He's also got the factory behind him, and he's got, like you said, he's with Chaz being there, just about family. I think that there's he's probably going to get privy to a lot more information rather than have to d- develop a bike sort of on his own at BMW or, right. or with Ryderberger. So I think this is a better spot for Eugene. I think I think he actually lucked out by not getting signed by his old team. 
Yeah, it could it could yeah. prove to be like that, you know. And yeah. you know, after that happened, though, after they decided uh, his team decided to go a different direction, he was out of a ride, and so there were a lot of rumors flying around before this Go Eleven news broke, including, of course, the rumor that he would come to the United States to race a superbike in Moto America. So, of course, you know, I asked him about it. Yeah, I did um, consider Moto America. I know a few guys did. Uh, Marco Malandri did as well. Um, he was pretty open about it. It's a, a great championship, and we've always got to see it at Laguna Seca. And we know how good the riders are there, of course. I always uh, get on well with Josh Hayes. And then seeing, of course, Tony Elias going across. And I think Tony is one of the most underrated riders out there. So uh, I know um, he's world level, and the fact that the other guys are up there battling with them. We know it's it's competitive, and yeah, you guys uh, do things right in America. I think all of guys in Europe. We also watch Supercross, of course. The show's so good, and uh, that's what's appealing. Would have been nice. Well, look, <laughs> I, I'm happy to hear him say that because you and I, obviously, I get so tired of listening to like, oh, Tony's washed up, Tony's done, Tony's got kicked out of paddocks. It's just such crap. I just. We're so lucky to have Tony racing in our championship and elevated our championship, if you ask me. Um, mm -hmm. He definitely changed how our series operates on the racetrack itself. Uh, in America, over the years, you know, we, there was a pattern. Josh Hayes would get the lead. He wanted to lead. He didn't want to be behind anybody. And that was – there was nobody – for a while that that could beat josh because josh had a mindset of what he wanted to do and then when tony came in and obviously with cameron there tony came in and kind of changed that a little bit where even if he fell back he was going to be there at their end i agree with eugene that, that tony is one of the most um underrated guys out there now these guys get to come to america and see us at laguna every year they see how how good our championship is um and I think that the weather, new tracks, there's a number of things that America can do as far as encourage some of the European riders to come back here. That's 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 when you and I were racing, Greg. It, I mean, how many how many people did we have from other countries in our in our series? I mean, they were coming from everywhere, and I don't think that we're long away from starting to hopefully generate that a little bit more, getting some of these guys, bringing them back over to America. Uh, and it'd be fun to have Eugene or, or whoever else wanted to come over and, and race in our championship. Yeah. I mean, I'm glad he's on go 11, but it definitely would have been nice to have him. So, you know, as we were wrapping up our interview, I did ask him this question, like, is there anything that we didn't talk about that you wanted to talk about? And I was kind of surprised at his answer. Uh, Laguna Seca being back in the calendar is really cool. Um, I think that's something that everybody was disappointed about whenever the press release came out and we all read that. In 2019, we wouldn't be going to Laguna Seca, and uh, everybody was devastated. So just to see a surprise, uh, I think it was only uh, one month, maybe six weeks later, to see that Laguna Seca was back in the calendar, everybody was so chuffed. And I know some some friends of mine, even they get on and just book flights to get out there because uh, it's such a cool race, and the atmosphere is special. Um, that part of the world, everybody just loves Monterey and uh, Laguna Seca. It's something a bit different uh, compared to the other American races, even for us. I don't know, chuffed. What's what's chuffed? <laughs> what's that? Chuffed. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, chuffed. Yeah, he's chuffed. chuffed. He's, he's happy. Chuffed. They're happy. He's happy. Yeah, yeah no, yeah. I, I thought you I, said I, Chuck. I'm like Chuck. No, no, chuffed. chuffed. I, I, I yeah, gathered. Yeah, I gathered chuffed. what it meant, but I don't like. Oh, I thought my British meant heritage. Upset. I know what all these words mean, Greg. Yes, and, you do. and you know what? He's so right because even talking with with Alex, who we had on the show, Alex Lowe's a few you know a few podcasts ago. Like there was depression that these guys weren't coming back to Laguna. They love Laguna. I mean, they, I think that the whole event being in Monterey and all that stuff is so, it, you know, it's a little bit of our showcase race of the year because we get the world guys there. Um, and they, and they're the, where they were going to go, they were going to go to Kailami back in South Africa or South America. No, South Africa, yeah, right? South it's, Africa. Yeah, where, Kailami, yeah, South yeah. Africa. They were going to South Africa and all of them. I guess it's in a bit of a dodgy area that that track, and they mm. they were they were all so depressed. That that's where they were going instead of coming to Laguna Seca. Uh, I think it's great. I think it's good for it's good for our championship. It's good that our fans get to see these guys, and you can see the level of respect that that these guys all have uh, for our championship and being here. I just think it's a fun week. Now it is a quick turnaround for them, and a lot of the Brits, like Eugene and Alex and and, and Ray Sykes, all of them. Chaz, they, they go straight from Donington and literally they, they get done racing on Sunday. They got to get here 
So uh, as quickly as they can, because they race here in America, I believe it's the exact following weekend. So mm-hmm. uh, it's a quick turnaround for them. And then you got all the, some of these guys are testing for Suzuka. It's a busy time uh, to be traveling as far as they are, but it's good to see that they're all excited about coming to, uh, to Laguna Seca again. Yeah. I was really, really kind of, I don't know, just like, Oh, that's really nice. You know, in a way, like when he was given that answer, he's like Laguna. And I was like, Oh, that's cool. Because obviously you and I have been going to Laguna for years. You, you more than (laughs) me. And for us, it's like, you know, it's, it's never another race. I mean, the track is special. It's, it's one of my favorites in the world. There's no doubt about it, but to hear that the rest of the world likes it as much as they do. And because people have said, Oh, it's a little bit too small, or maybe it's a little bit too narrow, but the reality is, is that it's not just the actual racetrack or the race surface. It's the whole, it's Cali, dude. You know what I mean? It's, it's California. It's no, California. It's good. Yeah, it's good. We know that the weather's probably going to be pretty good. And yeah, and, uh, yeah, it's great. Well, you know, Greg, I, that great that you got Eugene on, uh, on this week. Big shout out to Eugene, uh, for, for being on. Thank you so much for that because we got some really true insight and it's nice that we, uh, we have connection with some of these guys, uh, mm-hmm. that are willing to jump on a call, especially from so far away. So I wish Eugene nothing but the best this year, uh, moving forward. And, uh, you know, we're going to look forward to seeing him line that Ducati up and at, at Australia. Hopefully, he gets some good time under his belt, and then we'll see him at Laguna. Hopefully, I think I'm going to see him sooner. I think I'm going to Thailand. I'm going to go to the, I'm going to go to the second round uh, after oh, cool. Australia. Cool. So I'm, uh, you know, hopefully I get a chance to see him over there. But looking forward to going to a few more of the World Superbike races myself this year, other than just Laguna. So I'm going to get to see these guys a bit more. Cool. Um, yeah. So, anyways, over the weekend, real quickly, we had round two, Greg of the monster energy supercross uh, oh, yeah. championship in Phoenix, um, you know, stick to the premier class, but you know, I gotta, I, I gotta give a small shout out to Adam C. And Cirillo. I, <laughs> I love the kid. I think he's, awesome. he's, I, he's just always finding a way to kind of, to just miss out. And this last weekend he put it together in the two fifty class. And I was really happy to see him, see him win. I think I'm probably a little partial cause he's a, because he's a golfer as well, um, which is good. <laughs> and he's a, he's a <laughs> but, uh, really nice guy, too. He's a really he is nice awesome. Guy. His interviews are great. You know what? His interviews, as same with Colt Nichols, both those guys are different than the rest as far as their interviews go. They're just, they don't sound so robotic. Uh, they sound like human beings. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, big shout out to Adam for for winning uh, and getting himself, obviously, only round two. He was never out of the championship, but he had a tough Anaheim one. They're going to be back at Anaheim this weekend. But looking at the 450 results, mm. um, Dude. Great, great, great weekend of racing. I mean, it was uh, it was hard fought all the way to the end. But to see Baggett come through, I don't think very many people thought that was going to happen. But Baggett comes through, beats um, defending champion Jason Anderson, and of course Ken Roxon, who had a little coming together during that race. But the guy, Greg, that I am, I'm actually really, really upset about is Malcolm Stewart getting hurt because oh, he man. looked. Didn't he, he? This year he just looks lean and mean. He looks. He's he's. He's been up front. He has a yep. broken femur. I've become a bigger fan of his over the years, um, just because it seems like his like he's working. But this year, he just he looked a little bit. I don't know. He looked a little bit more serious. And and um, the fact that he, he fell out of that race, thank goodness, only with a broken femur. I was thinking the worst when I saw him laying there for as long as I'm sure you were as well. But what'd you what'd you get out of the weekend? Yeah, I mean, first of all, get better. Malcolm, you know, obviously he's probably not listening to this podcast, but nonetheless, I mean, I I was really sad to see him hit the deck and I'm glad that it's just the injury it is. I I mean, I I don't know. Should Blake Baggett go dirt track racing? I mean, you're talking about a track in Glendale that was blue grooved up. I mean, it looked like an American flat track, uh, you know, circuit or whatever. But I, I, I'm glad Blake won. He's such a nice cat. But if you look back behind him, you have Jason Anderson, Roxon, Tomac, Muskan, Barsha right in the mix. I think you have your normal players. You know, I think the yeah. thing that made it so special was that Blake got his first. And I think um, there were some really aggressive moves. I kind of like the Jason Anderson, Ken Roxon ruckus. And I don't know if it's going to go but, anywhere. But Greg, I, honestly, I'm a, a, you know me, I, I love Ken Roxon. I mean, what that guy yeah. has fought back from and he's going to win races. Oh, yeah. I'm a huge fan of him. I love Jason Anderson too. I like both of them. Man, I've seen way worse. I've seen oh, way, no, way course. worse. I mean, you ever watch the Arena Cross so, series? Come on. That's, a, I mean, that's but, a, but, every corner. But you even take that away. I've seen way worse than Supercross. I mean, the commitment that Jason made early for, for that tight right was good. I think Roxon cut down a little earlier than he mm. thought probably too. And, and we see it all the time in Supercross. We really do. And, and I'm not here to say 
what I thought was fair or unfair, but I know that I have seen a lot worse. And Anderson was very remorseful in his he was. podium yeah. interviews. And, and Ken, you could tell, wasn't, you know, he was a little chippy about it, which he should be. I mean, as, as a racer, um, sometimes I forget that I haven't raced in a while. So I kind of say, ah, oh, take it easy, guys. Not that big a deal. But have I remember you, the emotions what, have and you ever that been, you go through. Have you ever been in the situation before where, you, you know, you had an incident with someone and then you end up finding yourself on the podium with them as opposed to at least separate into your own garage or your own transporter? Have you ever had that? Yes, I have had that actually, where someone's got under my skin um, on on the track, and then we get up on the podium. And you know, the funny thing is, is that the cool off lap is an amazing thing. And I think that, <laughs> and and I was lucky enough in in my particular case, I was lucky enough to kind of get hosed a little bit, come back past the guy that did it to me, and beat him on the podium. And the cool off lap has a funny way in our sport. In our sport we get a cool off lap. So we go around, we see the corner workers, you see the fans, you kind of get yourself out of the element of what had just happened. These guys, they literally go across, you know, the finish line jump there and they go straight to the podium. There's no, no middle ground. There's no recovery type of thing. So, Mm -hmm. you know, you, you know, when, when, when it happened with me, uh, it basically, it's just, if, even if you watch road racing in MotoGP, if you watch it, those guys might do something to each other, but when they get back into, park for me there and they're with their team you know they come over kind of congratulate each other most of the most of the trash talk is press conference or later when things have settled down and they had time to actually think about the race right so but you know it's the second round of the season you don't want to get enemies that quickly you got to always feel like that in supercross as long as the season is there's going to be some sort of retaliation but i don't really look at roxon like that i think he's got a program where he's going to be pretty consistent because if you watch him in the heat race he wasn't anywhere near it. I think he finished eighth in his heat race. I mean, he was so far back. But like the champion he is and what he's come back from, he gets a whole shot from the outside, leads the race, and then unfortunately they had to red flag it from Malcolm. But I don't read too much into the Anderson no, Roxon thing. No, me either. I mean, plus you have Ken Roxon leading the championship by one point. So it, we all know that in Supercross, it's critical to be leading these championships early on in case people start falling out or, you know, you have a little bit of an injury and you have to kind of sit back maybe one race and give yourself a break because of the, the schedule. So, you know, Roxon's not going to do anything stupid and try to retaliate when he's leading the championship and Anderson's already buried back in seventh spot. So I, I think, yeah, I think all of that stuff is, is just fine. I just love seeing the argument. I just love seeing the fights. I also think it's interesting this year, you know, we, where you have multiple pit reporters doing interviews. So you go from one to the other to the other. And so it kind of separates yep. those riders as well. It's not like in years past where we've done it, where I've been, had like riders who just got no, you know, an argument on the track and they have to stand <laughs> shoulder to shoulder. You know what I mean? Yep. Like, so I think, I think there's just little things like you're saying though, that help. And I, I, I often wondered why they would call that the cool down lap in our sport. Maybe that's, because, ah, yeah, very well done. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. 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 So yep. that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. But you know, um, so that's kind of our super cross synopsis I think is great. And of course we're lucky enough each week to have Chad Reed. Now for Chad, Jason last week during the, the podcast, he talked about, you know, giving himself a chance to do well. And, you know, he's the oldest guy to ever take a super cross gate now. And, I wanted to talk with him about his thoughts on Glendale. He qualified fourth and he felt that he found something in the front end of the motorcycle that he's been searching for for years and that he rode with ease. And, you know, things were looking pretty promising for Reedy heading into the main event. So, yeah, strange main event. I did not get a great start. Um, and I started moving forward, but it seemed like I would go one step forward and two back every time. Like it just, I was, I was better than the people I was around and I had more pace than the people I was around. And I, I kept just finding myself in the wrong places at the wrong time. And I got frustrated with it and just went kind of just lost positions, really a couple of positions and just more just because I was frustrated that I was better than that. Um, I obviously wanted to repeat you know, the, the feeling and the riding that I had, you know, shown earlier in the heat race. And, and unfortunately that just didn't, didn't happen. So definitely a frustrating one for me. Um, you know, when the red flag came out, I was, I believe 11th and, you know, had to do the staggered start, which is always kind of a funky, weird, you know, thing. Like I, I, it's kind of one of those things where you understand why they do it. You know, like if I was leading the race, I would definitely prefer to say, hey, let, let's let's stagger start this thing. Um, but as somebody that was frustrated and kind of wanted that 
that chance of, you know, dropping the gates again, you know? Um, so I think that that's just a natural athletic, you know, or competitor wanting when, you know, like if, if you're winning, you want, you want to stagger. And if you're a little bit, you know, if you're mid pack, then you, you want to drop the gates again and give yourself a shot. Um, so yeah, it's frustrating main event, but I think with all of that said, you know, a lot of the feelings that were positive through the day were still there in the main event. I just think I didn't ride my best and I, I rode, I rode frustrated because I knew I was better. Um, you know, I look at the results and the end result and who won and, you know, who was second and third and all that. And I really honestly believe that that was a weekend that, that like I was good enough to win. I really was like, I truly believe that, you know, the, the right opportunities and, and me actually more than anything, me riding the way that I rode in the heat race, like that was a real, it was a real opportunity for me to win the race. So kind of left a little bit of a, you know, better t taste in my mouth a little bit, you know, leaving there and, and, uh, but Phoenix has always been like that. Like, I feel like I've always been good in Phoenix, but just never great. Jason comments. Well, number one, you can hear it in just in his voice that he feels that that he could be up front still, which is great. I, probably more so than the last couple of years, especially last year when he was on the Husky. But but the other thing I think that is really interesting when you listen to him speak right now is this is the biggest difference between Supercross and road racing. Starts are so key. Everybody's lined up on the exact same line. And I think that if you watch him in his heat race, he came through people so quick. Now, you take the other nine, say, fastest riders from the heat, before um because he finished second uh he finished yeah he finished second in the first yeah. heat i believe so, so he was fourth he was fourth so fastest fourth the, the, fourth quicker heat yep. was quicker yeah correct so when you look at it it's if you get behind you know obviously you had a bigger group of guys you had to go through but the continuous line changing that you have to do in supercross to make passes and to me that that track looked pretty one line to me uh the, the phoenix track looked pretty one line so when he said he He'd kind of get by guys. My feeling is he would get probably by guys and then not be, let's say, particularly where he wanted to be for the next set of uh, rhythm section or whoops or or whatever the case might have been. And so two guys might go back by him. So it it definitely sounds like it's frustrating. I agree with him 100% on the restarts. I've always thought in our sport, if you had a six-second lead, that they should give you that six-second lead when you restart mm -hmm. a race. Mm -hmm. In this case, they start single file. Um I know why they don't do it in our sport because it, it does confuse people. If a guy's got a six second lead and he finishes third and actually wins. Um, but, but in this case, I don't know of another way that they could do it. But like Chad said, if you're, <laughs> if you're leading the race, you don't mind it so much, but if you <laughs> really wish that you could get another shot at that start, that is, that is key. I think, I think he's better than he's finishing though, Greg. I, I think that he's, his pace is much better. His times this year seem a lot faster than they were. Um, and and I think that it's really going to be come down to gate pick and making sure he gets off the line better. I think Chad Reed has more bandwidth as a rider now that he's just a rider than yeah. a team owner and a rider. And I yeah. think that he's using that bandwidth to analyze more what he's doing right and what he's doing wrong. And I think it's really helping him out. And I just wouldn't be surprised, given the right situation, if he was able to win a race i think he's did you hear the crowd did you hear the crowd greg when he was passing people oh, in the yeah. race you could hear oh, it yeah. i mean they were going nuts so yeah no i i i'd love to see him love to see him get up there and and get a i'd like to see him get off the line in the top five and then just see what he could do from there because mm -hmm. i think i think even last year he got good starts kind of went backwards i don't think that's going to happen mm. i don't think that's going to happen this year i think he'll be able to to run the pace a little bit more. And it seems like some of the guys are a bit cautious. Like I'm a little surprised Tomac has been nowhere other than he's gathering points. He's always found a way to throw this championship away kind of in the first half of the season has Tomac. So right now it seems like he's kind of content getting his points and letting the season settle down and, and just he's, kind of I mean, he's had some bad there, luck know? a little bit, you know, going to the, True, LCQ, the heat race, he had a bad luck. Yeah. And, he yeah. went to the LCQ yep. and after the LCQ, he won it, of course. And then he just said, ah, you know, tonight I think I needed the extra laps. So, Yep. You know, good attitude there for sure. So no, for sure. But none of those guys want to do the extra laps. They, mm. you know, they, they, you know, they definitely don't want to do the extra, extra laps, but let's Hey, Greg, let's, hmm? how about our little fantasy super cross? We all just, right. We're, no, we're, we we're, skip we're, this, we're, we skip this segment. No, no, no. We're not hmm? skipping this at all. <clears throat> so, what? you know, I gave all your pats, all their credit at the beginning of the show, but oh. how many, how many guys we got now, Greg on our, uh, 
in our group. I think we got what close to eighteen or twenty people now that have. Nice, that, that, so thanks nice to try. all of you guys. Nice try. Thanks for nice try. Isn't we have there thirty six? Do we really thirty six people it's now funny. in our group? Mm-hmm. If I scale all the way to the bottom, mm-hmm. all the way, mm-hmm. it's funny. You're still on that page. Uh, yeah, you're on that page. Ooh. At the top of that page, so, though, I'm at the top of the bottom. Boom. Oops. Yeah, you are. <laughs> you are. But anyways, it was a good weekend for our fantasy supercross last week. Those of you uh, that 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 got in there, and uh, and and I see a lot of my friends on here. A lot of guys within our industry got some. I've been getting some text messages from a couple friends or a couple guys back east saying, "Jay, we're kind of we're East Coast Midwest road racers, and we're on your group. I love it. No, um, I, love I see it. my fr- my friend Mark Bothays on there. I mean, Mark, he's at, where's he at? He's in Germany, isn't he? No, no, he's in uh, Sweden. Sweden, that's right. Sweden, he's that's cool. sixth. Yeah, he's he's yeah. sixth on our. He's sixth. Yeah. But anyways, I I they need to put numbers next to these so I could tell everybody exactly what place you're in. But let's just say there it's are, toward the bottom. There are numbers. Okay, just look. Come on, I'm not seeing it. Because you're an idiot. All right, first of all. Yeah, that's true. That's Lug true. Nut 69 is leading Oh, you're the 27th. Way. I, you're, I, see, see, this is the problem. I wasn't 27th when 25th. this was over. I'm 25th. You're yeah. 25th. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're 25th. 25th, all right? So it's pretty good for you. Lug Nut, 30, yeah, just yeah, shut 36, up. Lug Nuts leads the way with 74 points. You somehow miraculously, I don't know who you're paying off, have 72 points, okay? Mm. And you're, but you, but, but, but you're also ranked 4,856 overall. All right. Greg, 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 Greg. Greg. <clears throat> yeah. That's, go ahead. That's okay. It's no problem that I'm ranked, whatever you said. You're ranked, you're ranked 51,451st. Am I reading mm. that right? The worst part <laughs> is if you go above me, oh the guy God. who's, or the, the guy or the girl who's Ricky Graham three and Ricky Bobby 39, they're not even, yeah. they're, they're, their overall ranking is not even available. It says NA. And they're still ahead yep. of me in, in, in this group. So it's not good, G Dub. Mm. That's not good. Mm. And and my boy Kevin's third. I mean, Kevin got into this thing literally ten minutes before round one. I said, Kev, you gotta get in, you gotta get in, and he's third. Well, here's the so, here's the beautiful thing. What yeah. I'm counting on is the yeah. fact that you won't make your picks while you're in Australia. Okay. I will. Now here's don't, the, don't even second guess that. But I'm gonna give you some good news about fantasy. Okay, let's okay. Hear it. And I learned this from producer Dan, who's in our group, who producer Dan, I think, is 19th, so he's ahead of me. If you make picks the week before and you forget to make your picks, it automatically defaults to the last picks that you made. So it's not like oh, you does. get yeah, not like you get a goose egg for not oh, actually cool. making your that's picks. Good. Yeah, right. So these, these guys have thought everything out on this uh on this fantasy mm-hmm. thing. They thought it all out. Yeah. I mean And this is the yeah. rmfantasysx.com fantasy that we're playing. It's a free deal. So if you're on there, it's the Rocky Mountain uh, ATV MC fantasy deal. So rmfantasysx.com. We don't get, we're not getting paid. Or, I mean, we don't even know we exist, basically. But we're just having, <laughs> but it's fun. We're having fun. Yeah, we're having fun yeah. talk about it. And um, we I, got racing going on right now. Uh, road race stuff's a little bit quiet, other than some talking. But we're waiting for bikes to get on track. So the Supercross thing is on every Saturday. You get to watch it on hey, NBCSN or NBC. It's great. That's right. And by the way, okay, if anybody out there is listening who knows anybody from this rmfantasysx.com or knows how to do these things, we want to try to put something together. And I know Roger Hayden, we're going to make that retired racer, the commissioner of the whole thing, but put some, yep. something together for Moto America so we can do the same thing. I mean, Jason, and I, I wouldn't participate in it, maybe. Like, at least yeah, I wouldn't right. tell anybody about it because... If, you know, for the commentators, then, you know, who's going to say, but it still would be a lot of fun to do it because it just makes everything so different. I mean, one of my picks, um, Joey Savacci didn't even make it out of his heat race and he got injured, you know? So I went in there just belly aching as it was before, you know, the, the main event even started because I knew I was already suffering on scoring any points. So, you know, and yelling at the TV and, you know, it's fun. I mean, it's a, it's a good bit of fun. That's, it is a good time, right? It's a good time, right? Yep. Right. And I'm, hopefully, it's Joey gets better too. These guys get dinged up, man. No, I'm do. telling you, Supercross guys are so gnarly, so much gnarlier than us. These guys get dinged up, and hey, listen, they that's back, why the New England fight next week. That's why the New so. England Patriots lost a couple games this year. They were just resting. Right. We already talked about them. Well, you know, Jason, for three generations, Arai has been making some of the world's best helmets, and of course, Arai helmets meet all safety standards, but they also pride themselves on having a blend of engineering tech and human craftsmanship that makes an Arai helmet fit better and feel better, which also protects you better. 
your head is worth the best. Visit AriAmericas.com for more information on tech fit and paint jobs. AriAmericas.com. You owe it to you. And that means that it's time for our quick shift segment presented by Arai. And I'm going to start, Jason, by saying on Crash.net, Peter McLaren talked to Tech3KTM's Hervé Poncheral, one of my favorites, about the switch from Yamaha to KTM. And he was quoted in the headline as saying, quote, some people laughing at us thinking we made a big mistake, unquote. He also later says that, quote, yeah, it's a process that I hope will not be too long, but we have a lot of work ahead of us, unquote. Jay, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but what do you think overall about the move of Tectua to go from Yamaha, very established, to KTM? I love it. You know why? Because it's a new challenge, and this guy had the nerve to go give it a shot. And and the KTM looks like a promising bike. Right now, it doesn't. It, it looks a little bit off. I don't know... You know they've they've had Bradley and they've had uh, uh, Paul obviously on that bike for the last couple of years. Um, I know Mika Calio's done some testing or been testing their test rider. I think now that again it, it's kind of like what Ducati's done in World Superbike. Now they're going to have four bikes on the grid. I think that with the amount of people, with the amount of uh, of laps that they start to do, they're going to start to get that bike better. And you know if Hervey hadn't taken the the chance. We'd all be sitting there saying, "Oh, you know, he had a chance to get in with a full factory team, and he didn't." I don't think that you're you can be in a winning situation uh, either way. But for me myself, I like it. I like the fact that they got Zarco. I like the fact they got Oliveira. Um, Pedrosa thing is is a mystery to me. I don't. I can honestly say I'm not really fully convinced that that was the best move. Not because I don't believe in Danny. Um, you know, their their whole preseason testing was you got to think Greg was going to be based around Danny Pedrosa mm -hmm, being yeah. able to ride the bike. Now he's got uh, a collarbone that they had to they had to do some stem cell on. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, there's got to be some frustration there in the walls of Kawasaki uh, KTM rather um, about Danny not being able to ride. Also on Crash.net this week, Greg Hayden Cobb posted an interview with Suzuki Moto GT, GP boss David Brivio. He says his Moto G team is making Alex Rins quoted a top rider. As much as we have talked about, where does Suzuki go from here in terms of development? He had said um, he had this to say about test rider Sylvain uh, Gintley. Uh, quote, Sylvain has a lot of experience and is very sensitive to changes on the bike. His comments are always accurate, mm -hmm. which is really appreciated by the engineers. We will continue to work with him next year because 2018 was our first year with a test team. And we had to start developing this new approach. Now we are ready to make another step and make their work easier, probably meaning the engineers, obviously, mm. but also more efficient and productive for us. What do you think about K uh, Suzuki having, you know, basically a full test team now, as does Ducati and Honda for the last few years? Uh, you think this is going to help them be closer to the front? I don't know. You and I have kind of talked about it before, you know, the loss of Iannone. I, I mean, I, I like that, that Brivio is out there saying that stuff. I'm just not convinced just yet. My Fear for Suzuki, if you can really call it a fear, is that they're going to get left behind in the development. And Sylvain Gintoli is a great rider. There's no doubt about it. But I don't know. I mean, on this one, I think for me, I'm going to have to kind of take the, the the wuss way out and just say the jury's out. I'm going to wait to see. But what about you? I, I disagree. I, I love that you think that because I think that for me, when you look at it, the discussions that you and I have had, I'm more worried about Ducati this year than I am Suzuki. And I'll tell you why. I think that they've got a young rider in, in Alex Rins who really believes that he could put it on the podium. Now, what you got to remember about test riders, Greg, is that when they're testing, they're looking at segments of racetracks. They're looking at places where if Alex Rins comes off and says, you know, uh, breaking from a fast straightaway, going down four gears, we have a weak point, blah, 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 blah. When they go testing, Gintley is going to be able to try to figure out the areas that he feels that the team is actually struggling in. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to be the fastest guy. And these, and we know how fast Gintley is. Mm. Calio proved well last year on the KTM. but And even uh, Michele Pirro on the Ducati. The thing that you got to remember is that when you're a test rider, you're trying to become a problem solver. And if they have belief in the fact that Gintley can help him get to that spot to where they start seeing that result, I don't think it's going to slow down development. I think it will only help it. And I think that Rins and Juan Mir, even though Mir was a little disappointing in Moto2 last year, he seems like he's doing okay so far in the Suzuki. Mm -hmm. um, I think it shows an incredible amount of confidence that Brivio has come out and said that that 
this is going to help their engineers more. I, and I, th- I, I really believe that Rins uh, could, could be up front this year on that Suzuki. Yeah, I look forward to seeing what they have. Now, Jason, a press release came out Monday that Tommy Hayden is now the director of racing for Estenson Racing, a five-rider American flat track team and partner to attack performance and fielding J.D. Beach and Moto America Superbike. Surprise move for Tommy? What do you think? It's great. I, Tommy Hayden is a guy that we that we that we need in our paddock that we need around. I know he's been with Monster now for a number of years, and I didn't actually read where he has stepped out of that position. I'm not sure. It would be a, a thing that we'd have to ask him. But this thing with Estenson Racing, I'm so proud to see another group get involved in our championship as well, getting involved with Attack. But Tommy, if you look at the three Haydens, was always he was always the thinker of the three, mm-hmm. um, uh, you know, as was Nikki and Raj. There's no disrespect there, but I think, I think everybody would agree that, that knows the Hayden family. Tommy's the quiet one, always kind of sits there, looks back. He's always in the back of the room, kind of listening. He's not so much talking about things. He just kind of listens. I think the, the confidence that the essence and team racing has shown in not only the name, but the ability to probably look back and make quality business decisions and thinking about going the right direction is something that, they looked at when this when this became available for Tommy. So uh, I think it's great. I think uh, if we get a chance to see him at more of our races again, I know he was at a lot of them before, but you know now in a little bit different role. Uh, I think it can only help JD and and the Dirt Track team he's associated with. Yeah, I reached out to him today to try to get you know him to just give us a comment on the podcast because I am curious if he's just going to be focused on the flat track or if he's going to you know come to our races because I'd love to see Tommy at more of our races during the course of the season, you know? All right. Well, yeah, congratulations, Tommy, on your new gig. We're getting close to the end here, Jay, but kind of like we did last week, you know, before we wrap this up, I wanted to add one more thing with Chad Reed, not as a supercross racer, but as a racer in general, we were talking about this coming weekend. So I, I pulled this clip from that chat. Now you'll hear him reference Valentino, which of course is Valentino Rossi because he and Chad are good friends. Anyway, in this clip, he gives some real insight into his mindset and how he feels, what he feels like, that he's rushing things at the racetrack. Listen, it, he'll explain it better. I shouldn't use the word that I feel like the, the, you know, the time's ticking, but in some cases that you, you, it's hard not to feel that, you know, you're, you're potentially in your last year and 36 years old and I feel really competitive, but yet with that feeling comes the need to to want to do it because each and every weekend becomes maybe, you know, one step closer to it being over. So I feel like I need to acknowledge that, accept it, and then just calm myself a little bit and try to enjoy the moment rather than so, you know, putting so much pressure on trying to, you know, execute the best, you know, you know, the best way of winning or whatever it is. You know, like I've had this conversation with Valentino and, and it's like, you know, being, you know, being one of the guys that sits on the couch and watches MotoGP at 7 a.m. on a Sunday morning, um, it's easy to see as a racer, you know, and turn into that couch racer that I'm like, ah, you know, like he's doing this, I could see it. And then I find myself reminding myself like, hey, like you're doing that, you know, like, like, I, you know, you get it, like you feel like those when the opportunity's there, it's almost like you get so excited, too excited, and, and then you try to take advantage of it, and then you almost mess it up for yourself. So I just feel that I, I, need, to, I need to understand that and, and just be okay with you know, where we're at and, and making the opportunity you know, work rather than overthinking it. Does that all make sense, Jay? I think that if – I think that it – how can I explain this? When I hear what he says, I think Chad needs to look at it in a way of not looking at it like things are coming to a close. I, he should be way more excited about what he even said at the beginning of our podcast talk with him in the sense that he's still competitive. He's If he still feels that, he's got to think more like Mob, probably he used to think of as a racer. The one thing I'll say over the last couple of years that the media has expressed is – Chad's the oldest guy. Chad's this is he's qualified for the most supercross main events. When you hear those things, it kind of gets in your mind that you've been around for a long time and that 
people look at you differently. When you go and you're lining up and you see a 20 year old kid next to you lined up and you think, wow, I'm 16 years older than that kid. Like it's, mm. <laughs> it's, it's hard to imagine. But what Chad's done is it seems like he's kept himself in good physical shape. Um, he still has the desire burning to try to win races. I think that he, if he could put himself in the mindset of forgetting all of the stuff as far as it's kind of dwindling down or it's coming down. I and mean, what happens if the guy goes out and wins two or three races this year and finds himself really competitive? It's going to give him a boost of like wanting to continue or whatever. I know he wants to transition into some rally car, which makes his him and Valentino's relationship even more <laughs> unique in the fact that that's what Valentino does, isn't it? I mean, yeah. he loves rally car stuff. So I think if, if I really think that what I saw out of Chad in that second heat last year or in his heat race last week, finishing second, the guy's obviously still got speed. He's still got that ability to go out and put laps together. Um, and I think that some of it is going to be every time he gets introduced, it's, you know, former champ been around, you know, I don't want to see the guy be the guy that's known for the most career supercross starts or the oldest guy. He's still competitive. He can still go out and do really well. So it's a very, very, very tough balance for him right now, I think. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, and you can kind of hear it in his voice. Like, you know, I don't know if you get tired of hearing that. Um, I don't, you know, motocross is so much different. Like road racing, we can stay around forever. Supercross is a little bit harder, a lot, lot harder schedule. Yeah. So, and you've seen him just do the supercross only thing. He did one national at the end of last year, but, you know, he's kind of picking and choosing the races he wants to do outdoor wise if he wants to do any at all. I, I kind of, um, I kind of get where he's yeah. coming from, though, from the perspective of, like if this is the, and he has not said it's the end, but he is really leaning in that direction. Like this could be the end. Well, of course. So there's almost, but you almost feel like people are trying to retire. Him. Exactly. That's what, feel yeah, like. That's yeah. what I hate. But, you know? but there's an urgency to like, I think that he's forcing, you know, does that make sense? Like meaning like, he's like, I've yeah. got to win. If I have the speed and I feel competitive, I need to go out there and win because this could be my last shot because this could be my last year. And I think he's getting himself spun out. Yeah. Imagine if you did, imagine if you could just imagine if you could never hear any of those things about being the all time supercross leader and starts the oldest guy out there, the blah, blah, blah. Imagine if you could just lock yourself away for a week, yeah. not listen to any of that crap, Yeah, get through your week of practice, get through your week of training, line up on the line Saturday night, be ready to go and not have all those murmurs in the background of being the legend that you are. Yeah. And when you go to the race, you got to remember people are coming up to chat and going, Oh, I was here 15 <laughs> years ago when you did this. And I was here, you know, that's, that's the reality of yeah. it though, isn't it? That, that, that you hear that stuff and it really, it does play on your mind. I think it does make you start to think to yourself, man, I have been doing this a long time. Yeah. Why am like, I'm still doing this, but if he loves it, it, none of it should matter. And if he still feels he can win, that's what he should be. Focusing you know, this, on, this whole conversation reminds me of two things. One, Tune out the noise, New England Patriots, and number two, Tom Brady, baby. Tom Brady. Mm. He hears the old stuff all the time, but he's still Tom Brady, and he proved it. All right. That's all we're going to talk Sorry, about. Sorry, folks. I apologize. <laughs> you got, It's just so grueling that we got to listen to that. Did you see what Tom Brady said? Did you see where he said in an interview that, well, people think we suck? Yeah, Did you hear him course. say that? Oh, yeah. It's the oh, best yeah. ever. That's... I'm sure you were on top oh, yeah. of all of his little interviews. Oh, yeah. But- the next time I do this, mm -hmm. we are not taking a week off. I'm committed here. I'm, okay. I'm taking all my stuff with okay. me. Next time you hear from me, yeah. I'm going to be in Australia. 16 hours the, ahead of me, by the way. I know. We're going to have to figure that out. But we'll figure <laughs> yeah. it out. Yeah, we will. I mean, hey, if we could do a podcast on Christmas and New Year's Day, we're, we can handle a, you know, a trip around the world. But I'm going to – I take off on Sunday. I land on a Tuesday morning. Uh, you, you and I will probably try to do something next week before the Classic and then – you know, like we talked about, I land, I come home on like a Wednesday. I land at six thirty in the morning, and I'll try to knock out a podcast with you that day, so we don't Perfect. miss any time. I made this and, one a little complicated, so I'm going to try to keep the next one a little bit simpler because you know I know that you're probably going to be in a house with a bunch of people around, so we'll try to nah, keep it we're simple. Gonna, they're all my friends. We're all going to love it. I might even be <laughs> able to sneak a couple of guys, you know, that are over there racing with me in on the podcast. If people have questions, you know, about the Phillip Island classic specifically. And they, you know, I'm going to have some, I'm going to have some of my friends over there with me, Josh Hayes and Steve Rapp and Larry Pegger, Michael Gilbert. Um, it, it's, it, how do you, how, how it's exactly be a lot of do fun. you walk with feet that bloody after dropping names on them like that? Are you kidding oh, me? Man, I got to, I got to give, I, I got to give Gilbert. team USA yeah. some hope here. I mean, mm -hmm. apparently the, 
apparently people are coming to kick our arse, right? So we well, want you to have that guy us, on. Why don't you bring that guy into the house? I could bring Dave on. Just, He'd yeah. do it in a heartbeat. He's, he's a good dude. He's a good dude. So all right. Um, well, anyways, listen, but enjoy yeah. your trip. Okay, enjoy Chuck Walla. Enjoy you. your trip to Australia. We look forward to hearing from you. We want to give our special thanks to Competition Works for sponsoring the show. Make sure you visit them. Competition W E R K E S dot com. Outstanding exhaust systems and other bits and pieces. You want to check out their amazing products made right here in the USA in Oregon. Thanks to Chad Reed and, of course, Eugene Lavery for spending all the time with us. JP, have fun in Australia. And you know what, dude? Fine, just go win something finally. I'm tired of hearing all these. <laughs> I didn't. You know, oh, I would yeah. have had the fastest. I had the fastest lap of the race, but, 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 you slacker. Oh, right. my God. I'm full, of, I'm full of excuses. Nope. I'm going to go over there, have a good time. And again, like you said, thanks to Eugene. Thanks to Chad. Thank you for a... Uh, Thank you for all our sponsors and uh, and thanks to Dev for again pulling uh, pulling some big names onto our show. It's amazing. Thank you, Jason. Good luck down under. 